Into the Blue. Hello, welcome back to Into the Blue. Hope you're all okay. This week I'm going to be looking at my top five movies featuring disability. But, like always, my picks are going to be taking that sort of darker path. So, let's take a look at number five. Julia's Eyes. So this film follows Sarah, a blind woman who believes there's someone there with her in her house, tormenting her. She then goes down to her basement, climbs up onto a stool, puts a noose around her neck, but right then she believes that this person is right there, right with her, and then a camera flash goes off and someone kicks the stool out from underneath her. Right then at that moment the film cuts to miles away her twin sister Julia who at that exact moment falls to the floor clutching her own neck and she knows straight away that something really bad has just happened to her sister. She knows that foul play has definitely taken place but when she gets to her sister's place with her husband Isaac the police are saying it's a suicide. Now Julia has got the same degenerative eye disease as her sister and knows she doesn't have that long until she too is completely blind. What's worse is that stress brings it on even quicker. Then Julia begins to suspect that she too is being followed and the same fate could await her. But her theories all fall on deaf ears with her husband Isaac and the police. And then Isaac completely disappears, just vanishes. So now she's forced to get through this whole situation alone and her vision is now at the stage where it just comes and goes and she now suspects that someone is always in the darkest corner of the room just watching her and waiting. This Spanish film is produced by Guillermo del Toro and it feels very giallo-esque too. The film is dripping in atmosphere and it does a great job in making the viewer feel the confusion and the paranoia that Julia feels. Once she becomes completely blind the film becomes really disorientated and has these really great little touches that are so so effective like once blind we never see the face of another person in the film so then everybody becomes a suspect the film is so tense it feels like you are just trapped in some kind of nightmare performances all round are fantastic but julia's character is so layered it's a phenomenal performance the film's really beautifully shot and it's full of these stylistic shots like pov ones from julia as her sight worsens or cameras lingering on the dark corners of a room and leaving our imagination to do the rest the film will have you completely gripped and in the second half you will spend the entire time constantly on the edge of your seat. At number four, The Peanut Butter Falcon. So this film follows a 22 year old man called Zach. Zach has Down syndrome. He's been abandoned by his family and he's living in an old folks retirement home as the state basically had nowhere else to put him. His main carer is called Eleanor, played by Dakota Johnson, and she really, really looks after him, but he just does not like it there. He's tried escaping a few times, and his only solace is this wrestling tape that he's held on to for years, featuring his favourite wrestler, the Saltwater Redneck. So, with some help from his roommate Carl, played by Bruce Dern, he escapes again. This time it's different. This time he's got a plan and his plan is to get to the wrestling school advertised on the videotape so then he can train and wrestle with his hero. So he's basically got to get from North Carolina all the way over to Florida. He's now got Eleanor, his carer, hot on his tail. She's been tasked with finding him and bringing him back as he's likely to listen to her. So then the film cuts over to Tyler, played by Shia LaBeouf. He's also on the run after losing his job. He's been bringing in illegal crab catchers and then he decides to burn down all the gear of his rivals who know what he's done and they're coming after him and they are nasty, nasty people. The two of them, Zach and Tyler, end up crossing paths and they team up to travel together and Tyler agrees to take Zach to the wrestling school. So they're trying to avoid the people that are after them. Tyler begins teaching Zach various life skills and starts coaching him to get him in shape for his wrestling. They even end up building a boat to travel by water. Firstly, this film is visually beautiful. The way they capture the broad marshes, the lush fields and these fast flowing rivers is perfect and it really gives it that Huckleberry Finn feel. The film really has a great cast throughout, but the two leads, Zach playing Zach and Shia playing Tyler, are both sensational. And for me, this is perhaps Shia's best performance to date. 
for it to work they had to have this really great chemistry and you can see that they've got that on and off screen they really really have the writers and directors of the film work really closely with Zach with his real life family saying that all of the small moments the gestures the sense of humor the inappropriateness the way he thinks and constructs what he's about to say is a hundred percent authentic films full of all these mini adventures full of great set pieces it can get really tense really dark in places but it's always hilarious it's an absolutely fantastic film about two people that really need each other zach needs tyler just as much as tyler needs zach it's about looking out for one another friendship and dreams and doing the right thing i found this film to be absolutely magical at number three poetry so this film opens with a river scene there are children playing on the bank when the body of a girl in a school uniform floats by the film cuts to Mia a 66 year old grandmother she's been sent to a specialist from her doctor about her forgetfulness she's diagnosed as being in the preliminary stages of Alzheimer's disease so this slow but sure decline into dementia is unfortunately on the cards for her now despite her age she still works she's got her loutish bad-mannered grandson that she still has to support who lives with her the grandson's in school and he's from the same class as the girl that was found floating down the river now this girl kept a diary and from it we learn early on that she committed suicide as for months she was being repeatedly raped by a gang of boys from her class so Mia has started taking these poetry lessons to help delay the progression of Alzheimer's by keeping the sort of creative juices flowing. She finds out her son had some sort of involvement with the dead girl and sadly the families of all the culprits are only interested in protecting their sons and they're covering the crime up and they're trying to raise enough money between them to pay off the family of the deceased girl so Mia now has to choose between exposing the crime or hiding it with the others and only by using poetry does she find the answer to that question this really is such a moving film and the director Lee Chang Dong has crafted this really special film that was able to see the beauty under all the ugliness one thing that really surprised me about this film is given the themes and the subject matter that the most affecting scenes were the discussions in the poetry class it's a film that completely locked me into this certain sort of state of mind and it just kept me there despite its around two hour 20 minute runtime and i didn't think about the time once during the entirety of the whole film poetry has a really smart script and it purposely leaves a few loose ends for us to form our own interpretation of what happened or what it means and it works really really well mia played by jun young he pulls in this complete powerhouse performance and she was actually taken out of retirement by the director lee chang dong for this role and she's absolutely magnificent she portrays this woman who's really worn down but she's not out and she can sort of sometimes give over this weak impression but she has got this rock solid moral core then throw in the fact of the alzheimer's then throw in the situation with her grandson it really is a 10 out of 10 performance at number two calm with horses so this film stars cosmo jarvis who plays douglas armstrong and he's known as arm he's a former boxer who's now an enforcer for the devers family and their drug dealing operation in a small town in ireland he works really closely with dimpna devers played by barry keogh and he's always reminding arm that they're really close just like family but they're not they don't treat him like that at all he's just their attack dog and Dimpner even treats him just like one he whistle at him like an owner would to a dog and he even calls him a good boy when he obeys and dishes out brutal violence on their behalf you can see that Douglas really hates working for this criminal family but a series of constant bad choices has taken him to the point where he's just completely lost and he really has no other option 
Arm has a partner or an ex-partner, Ursula, and their relationship now is one of Ursula not being too happy with him. And she has just caused. They've got a little boy together called Jack. He's autistic and non-verbal. Arm really loves Jack and he does try, but it's kind of a mixture of not understanding autism and not being around his son enough means that he just basically has no clue on how to handle his own son. An example is in one scene, Arm offers him candy floss if he just says a word, which obviously won't happen, which then leads to a huge artistic meltdown and Arm doesn't even realise that although they can look similar, an artistic meltdown is a million miles away from a child having a tantrum. So Ursula tells Arm that she has now got the chance to move away and to get Jack into a special school where he'll really get looked after well and get the help that he needs and the help that he deserves, but she needs money from him and it's quite sad because you sort of get the impression through Ursula that Arm wasn't always like this and it's just a real shame because if they could move all the bullshit out of the way they could really love each other again. So Arm has killed before and he's been put in a position now where the Devers family are asking him to do it again but he is really trying to do the right thing especially for his son so he starts to kind of resist their demands but this does not go well at all. And that's where I'll leave the storyline. This film is really sinister and violent, but it's also really sad and really touching. For example, there's a scene in the film that involves Arm and his son and a horse, which his son finds really therapeutic, hence the title. And this scene, wow, this is one of the most moving scenes I have seen in a long, long time. All of the cast completely knock it out of the park. Barry Keogh, amazing as ever, he sort of skulks around and prowls about with all this menace. You've got Neve Alger who plays Ursula, she is outstanding as this tired, desperate woman. She really loves a child but all the fight has gone, almost. Then you've got Cosmo who is phenomenal. He, for me, has got that same look in his eyes as a Tom Hardy or Matteo Schoenarts. Just that real sort of authenticity and his performance is so, so layered. I cannot wait to see what he does next. Killian who plays Little Jack, wow, spot on. My eldest daughter is non-verbal and autistic and like Jack, isn't high functioning at all. The makers of the film worked very, very closely with the National Autistic Association and it really shows. This isn't Rain Man where you can take them to Vegas and they'll count the cards for you and you'll win your fortune. And it definitely isn't that silly film with Ben Affleck where he can kind of use his autism as a superpower to work out the angles needed for firing his sniper rifles, which makes him this amazing hitman. This is the cold hard horrible horrible autism that you don't see in films and bravo for the filmmakers for going that extra mile to portray what it's really like and how it affects all the people around it for me this is a very very special film at number one the tribe. So this film opens with a lad who's got his briefcase in hand and he approaches a woman at a bus stop asking for directions but he does this by handing her a note so straight away we learn that he's actually mute and from her response to the note this then tells us that he's also deaf. His name is Sergei and he's joining a boarding school for the deaf but very quickly we learn that things are very very wrong at this boarding school. From the few adults that we do see, we learn that they are all in on it, but the place is completely run by the students and it's basically a base for them to run all of their criminal activities from. Sergei really wants to be liked and to fit in, so he joins in with them all. They take part in robberies, drug dealing, assaults, muggings, scamming, pimping and the prostitution of the female students. There's this sort of hierarchy and he starts at the bottom. But after suffering through a few of these hazing rituals that they have for him and then the accidental death of another lad who's further up the chain, he's promoted to pimp where he'd then take the girls to the nightly truck stop where they then sell their bodies to the truckers for cash. So then with the money that he starts to make, he decides to start to pay for one of the girls for himself, Anya. And then it happens. They fall for each other. 
He then doesn't want her prostituting herself, but then this relationship is seen by the rest of the gang as this breach of their laws. So they all turn on him and it is absolutely brutal and I mean beyond belief brutal. Then to make things worse, Anya falls pregnant and has to have a secret backstreet abortion. Now what's really different about this film is that there is absolutely no dialogue in the film and it's all using sign language. But then the other thing, we get no subtitles, no subtitles at all. So we have to watch their sign language. We pick up the little nuances, gestures, gasps and grunts to follow what is being said. And it works amazingly well. After a few minutes, you are completely able to follow along without any problem at all. There's this constant atmosphere of tension and dread. The visual style of the film has these really meticulously composed widescreen shots that then alternate their fixed perspectives with camera movements in these long straight single takes and there are several scenes like the severe violence or the backstreet abortion scene where you really wish the camera would pan away but it never does. With the film having no dialogue it really enhanced the detailed sounds that we hear that register every cry of pain, every slap punch, snap or crunch of bones, every intake of breath. There's a hell of a lot that will stay with you from this film. Like I said, it really is so, so brutal. But the final scenes of this film won't just stay with you. They will truly bury under your skin and settle there for a long, long time. So that was my top five movies featuring disability. I hope you got some decent recommendations from that list and I'll be back again in two weeks time with another list in another genre. I'll see you then. Cheers.